All right. I am really, really glad to welcome back to Bad Faith Podcast, John Nichols. You know him as the national affairs correspondent for the nation. He's written and co or co-written or edited over a dozen books on topics ranging from histories of American socialism, the Democratic Party, to the U.S. and global media systems, and most recently co-wrote a book with Senator Bernie Sanders titled It's Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism. Thank you for joining us back again on Bad Faith. It's a great honor to be with you, and this really is one of my favorite podcasts. So I'm, you know, I feel like I've risen to a higher level today. <laughs> Well, John, I mean, I feel like you're really baked into the uh, the the mana of bad faith because you were there for such a pivotal moment, not just in podcasting history, but in American. No, was it was it you who were, who was there when the storm the Capitol, or was it Thomas Frank? No, it was I Thomas can't Frank. I think it was Thomas um, Frank. On the day, I remember on the day of the stor Capitol storming, I was doing a lot of radio though, and it was fascinating because um, it, there's a guy named Jeff Santos who has a good radio show. And um, and has had it for many, many years. And it happened. I had a regularly scheduled gig with him and uh -huh. I was busy. Call I mean, it was in Wisconsin. So I was busy calling people and trying to figure out what all was going on. And then it was time for Jeff's show. And I thought, well, you know, I owe him this debt. You know what I mean? He's been a good. Mm -hmm. I've always done it. And so even though it's a crazy afternoon, I was writing and everything I called in. And then things actually because of the timing, it was very early stages. It got crazier and crazier. And so we were doing like um, commentary as it was you know, I had my big mm. TV on the corner and it was a crazy day. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. And that's why it's kind of interesting to be talking again mm -hmm. um, at this stage in the American primary when you're someone who has been covering these kind of domestic political events much more closely than I have or much more long, long, long than I have. Um, and I'm really interested to get some of your insights. Um, we've got a lot on the docket. I want to talk yeah. a little um, uh, horse race with you. Given the events of the past few days in Gaza, we would be remiss not to kind of provide some kind of update and reflection on what's going on there and how that's affecting the 2024 presidential race. And I also want to talk to you about some of your recent writing, specifically on uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and that part of the Republican caucus that has been exercising its own sort of force to vote moments over the last year or so, and how the most recent effort came to a fruition and what you think about sort of the logic and efficacy of that sort of a move. Um, but let's let's start with horse race, because okay. as many listeners will probably already be aware, there was a pretty stunning piece that came out in uh, The New Yorker last week titled, Is the Biden Campaign Running on False Hope? Uh, it's an interview by Isaac Chotner um, with a gentleman named Simon Rosenberg, who is described as a longtime party strategist who runs a substack called, and it could not be more on the nose than this, Hopium Chronicles. Okay. And this interview very, very quickly goes off the rails because Isaac Chotner offers some, I think, pushback to the narrative that Joe Biden is in a really good place in his campaign. And the pushback is based on a whole host of evidence, including a lot of polling that does not, in fact, look very good for Joe Biden. So first I wanted to open up the floor and ask what you make of this posture that seems to be held by so many people in Joe Biden's, <clears throat> excuse me, orbit, including this hopium guy that says, to the extent that there is evidence suggesting that Biden isn't doing well, the fact that he is behind in all but one of the crucial swing states. Uh, the fact that there are now more never uh, Biden voters and never Trump voters. The fact that many people predicted that once Trump's trials got under the underway, once we got closer to the election because of Dobbs, because of a whole host of issues that he would come out ahead. That is not what's happening right now. But we're not really seeing that kind of understanding being reflected in the posture of the Biden administration or those close to him. So you put everything on the table um, and and I'll begin with the with a, a slight defense of Simon, uh, of, our, of our hopium guy, as we say. <laughs> sure, um, sure. Let's hear it. He has gotten it right a couple times in the past. And it's interesting. Mm -hmm. He has. Said, when, when was that? Uh, in, in Actually, in uh, 2022, when they were pre predicting the, you know, kind of the red tsunami. Right. And all this mm -hmm. stuff. And he was saying, no, it isn't going to be a red tsunami. The Democrats are going to do a little better than expected. And and so, you know, he got that right and give it to him. 
right? He's got a measure of credibility there, and and that's okay. I say that up front because I think he's wrong um, in this in this <laughs> yeah. setting, right? Um, and and here's why: it's very very different when you're talking about a range of gubernatorial and congressional and legislative races across the country versus a presidential race. We have a different pool of voters. We have a different dynamic in play, uh, and so. To say, well, somebody got it right in 2022, they're going to get it right in 2024. Very dangerous game, I think. Here's what I would say is my view as regards Biden right now. I think there's a decent chance that Biden could win. I I don't Mm. rule that out. But what he's doing right now in no way is helping him to win. And in fact, I think that we see with Joe Biden uh, uh, and with the people around him uh, a kind of ongoing crisis of 1970sism. They are a bunch of people who came into politics, not all of them, but a lot of them, in the 1970s, and mm-hmm. they they approach global affairs, and we'll get into Gaza and things like that in a little bit, uh, domestic affairs and elections, as if it was 50 years ago, right? And that you know things will fall into place in certain ways and patterns will come together and Richard Daly will help you carry Chicago or something like that. And, and the problem with it is, is we live in a radically different communications age. We live, frankly, in a radically different country. Things have changed a great deal. And so I think that uh, they are, they're living on a measure of false hope. They, they're expecting mm. that, that the American people will somehow Sometime in, I don't know, I guess early October, just lean back and go, you know, I hadn't really thought about things for a while, but I guess Joe Biden's great, you know, and that's that's the theory. Um, and, and and in fact, maybe to, to give it one more level or one more layer of, of respect for them, I think their also assumption is that when you lean back in early October, you also go and Donald Trump is horrible. Right. Mm-hmm. And that somehow that combination will get them across the line. Here's where I think it's it's very dangerous. And we can go much deeper, and I know you will. Um, I think, and we'll talk about this. I think that Gaza and Biden's response to it is a is a catastrophe, and it's a very very serious issue for his reelection campaign. Much more serious than I think most uh, pundits and most uh, politicos imagine. I've been out there. I was at the student protests. I've been in the primary states. I've talked to the people on the ground. This is not some casual thing. These are people who really are A, very informed and B, horrified. And so the notion that that's going to casually go away, uh, I think is wrongheaded. Secondly, um, I I think that there was a very instructive poll by The Guardian recently. And The Guardian didn't ask the usual poll questions. They asked a bunch of information questions and they said, um, do you think the economy is doing good? People were like, no, I think it's a mess. Um, do you think that the stock market is doing well? No, I think it's a mess. Do you think unemployment is good? No, I think it's a mess. Now, the people were often wrong, right? I mean, their, their, their factual impression was not right. And so you saw a lot of Democrats say, well, see, they don't even know what's going on. But I disagree with that. I think they were giving, folks are being questioned in this terrible media age where you don't have a lot of good information anyway. They're being asked, you know, how do you feel, basically? And what they were saying mm-hmm. was, I don't feel good. I don't feel like it's good. I don't feel like Joe Biden's the greatest president ever. I don't think, feel like what he's delivered has been sufficient. And so you can't say that the people are wrong and just assume somehow they'll get it. right. Somehow they'll figure it out. Um, if Biden is to win this election, he has to do two things. Number one, uh, he has to stop saying, I've been the greatest president ever on a whole bunch of things. Right. I'm the greatest president since FDR. That's just not yeah. true. You know, I mean, he's done some good things. And I'm first in line to say some good things he's done. But he's also failed to accomplish many of the things he set out to do. And he has failed to kind of move the needle in the way that you need to move the needle. And and so if he wants to claim to be a modern incarnation of FDR, what he has to do is respect what FDR did in 1936. When FDR ran for reelection in 1936, after having won very big in 32, he's up in 36. The depression is still going on. FDR did not go out and say, I'm the greatest president in history. I've done all this great stuff. FDR said, I see a nation that is still hurting. I see a nation with you know, great poverty, 
with denial of, of sufficient resources. I see all sorts of problems. I need another term. I need a bigger majority because we have to fully address those problems. You know, I've tried to do some things. I've done some things that I think are good, but I, I fully acknowledge we're not where we need to be. And Biden has to do that. If he doesn't, he's not really making that great a case. To the extent that I agree with you that Biden has to stop saying, um, you know, Muhammad Ali style, I'm the greatest, and yeah. pivot to a more humble posture and make the case for why he's going to be able to do more or to complete the job in the next four years. My feeling is that that narrative is really thwarted by the fact that he spent the last four years explaining why he couldn't do anything at all with the majority that he begged us for back in 2020. So that was the narrative then, right? If you don't only help me win this election, but you also secure Georgia for me, then here's here comes the moon and the stars. And immediately promises made were reneged upon, whether it was the quantity of the checks that were promised quite specifically as mm -hmm. people were door knocking in Georgia, mm -hmm. um, whether it was the promise to cancel all the HBCU debt or on and on down the line. And you can say, well, Joe Biden was thwarted by Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, and it wasn't his fault. But I'm old enough to remember that there was this whole conversation about the filibuster and whether or not Democrats should get rid of it. And the wisdom of the establishment at the time was that, well, if you get rid of the filibuster, you're empowering Republicans, and it's better just to have an ineffective Joe Biden presidency than to open the door to an, an empowered Republican Party the next time around. But it does feel in some ways like they've now made their bed, where Joe Biden can't really credibly claim anything's going to be different over the, the next four years if he hasn't substantively reevaluated the barriers, or at least his kind of the self-proclaimed barriers to him doing X, Y, and Z. And I caveat self-proclaimed because I do think that there was more that he could have done, as we've talked about at nauseum on this podcast, whether it's the $15 minimum wage that got stripped parliamentarian style from the um, must pass COVID relief package or student loan debt, um, which he did not have to means test, all things like that. But that being said, I mean, what do you make of that? How can he make the case that all he needs is another four years when the conditions that existed for the first four years that he says are what blocked him from doing better aren't going to change? I can't disagree with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I will uh, only suggest to you, my good comrade, that um, in politics, uh, politicians always promise you more than than they give you. Um, I'm not saying that's good. I'm not saying that that's even necessarily always useful, but it is reality. And um, and so as we talk about the 2024 race, at the very least, Biden has to offer more. Right. We're talking at first about his his actual problem right now, that question of whether you can win. Simply by saying you're the greatest. Right. Or you've done your best since FDR, accomplished all this stuff and try to convince people that somehow an infrastructure program is the equivalent of the New Deal. Right. That's ridiculous. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do more than that. Now, your points are all well taken. I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. However, I will tell you in politics, you still have to at least try. Right. I mean, his alternative is to literally go out with this. I'm the greatest. Right. Or. Or you don't know how good you have it, which is one yeah. of the worst slogans ever, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So by the nature of it, what Biden needs around him, I would argue, is different people. Uh, people who will say to him, look, th this strategy that you've got is clearly not working because you can look at the battleground state polls and yeah. I know that polls aren't always right. And I know that maybe there'd be different dynamics and blah, blah, blah. But when you combine the battleground state polls with the, the, and this is anecdotal, but I think you and I would agree on, on this. I think everybody serious about politics would agree on this. The fact that there is an enthusiasm gap, you know, mm -hmm. roughly the size of the Grand Canyon, right? Mm -hmm. um, something's got to shift. It can't just be, you know, carrying on. And let me just give one last core point here. Biden winning or losing isolated is secondary to the bigger question, right? And that is, do you have a, a president and a Congress that is, you know, trying to do something good, right? You know, I, that's a very, very low bar, right? But but do you have a decent president in Congress or do you have a an awful president in Congress, right? And so it isn't just about Biden. It's about electing a Congress that could actually function with Biden if Biden's reelected. 
if he is reelected with a Republican Senate, right? And this is understand this, that um, uh, Joe Biden, maybe he does pull it off, right? He gets a 10,000 vote victory in Arizona and a 25,000 vote victory in Wisconsin. And he slides through somehow in Pennsylvania, a couple other things move in the right way. He becomes president by the, again, that narrow, narrow margin that he had in, in 2020. But with a Republican Senate, um, he's going to be a lame duck president from day one. So it isn't just about Biden running for re-election saying, re-elect me. It's, it has to be about something much bigger than that. And if it isn't, if it isn't about huge aspirations, big goals, and, some, and to your point, convincing argument that you can achieve those goals, um, I, I think you're really talking about, at best, the prospect of a placeholder presidency for four years. And this country can't handle that. Here's the problem again, John, that this is a Biden specific problem. And this is what Ezra Klein points out as well in his big, big uh, Biden skepticism piece from last week uh, titled Seven Theories for Why Biden is Losing and What He Should Do About It, that this is a Biden specific problem, that when you look at, let's say, Ruben Gallego's race against Carrie Lake or any other of these uh, high profile races across the country, that the down ballot candidates, the congressional congressional candidates are not faring as poorly as Joe Biden is, which is why I think it's really useful when Ezra Klein, who's got a lot of flack, frankly, for, I think, saying the obvious for some months now, when he says, well, look at what what is going on here? Like, what are the theories for why he's losing? And he takes them on one by one. He says, well, are the polls wrong? And this was our um, our hopium friends contention that the polls are wrong. And he says, well, no, they're, they're the, there's the um, argument around the, the midterm 2022 polls that you brought up. But both Ezra Klein and uh, uh, Chotner both point out that, yes, there was a predicted red wave, um, but the polls were more accurate in 2022 than in any cycle in at least um, since at least 1998, according to 538. Moreover, uh, to the extent that polls have been wrong in recent presidential elections, they've been wrong because they've been biased toward Democrats. OK, yeah, I certainly do remember that. Um, uh, Klein says, well, is it about the economy? Is it about rising prices and high interest rates? I think you're right. I think that that is accurate and true and that some of that is beyond Joe Biden's control, although I do think his messaging could be better when talking about the new reports around corporate greed um, causing inflation as opposed to anything that he's doing financially. I also think that every incumbent, and this is something else that Ezra Klein points out, across the world is facing this kind of challenge. And my subjective view, and I wonder what you think of this, John, is that the incumbents are dealing with the fact that, generally speaking, we're having a we're, we're witnessing the, the 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 vulnerability of capitalism and mm-hmm. how subsequent mm-hmm. generations are just overall doing worse than the ones before them. And so whatever microeconomic trends are happening, and you might catch an upswing or a downswing depending on your luck as a candidate, at the end of the day, you're you're contending with the fact that millennials feel like they're worse off than Gen X and Gen X feels like they're worse off than boomers and God help Gen Z <laughs> driving their, you know, Ubers and, and working on their Zoom screens or whatever they're doing, you know? So, and you go down the line and line, and again, more Trump, uh, sorry, Biden specific stuff. You have the fact that he is a historically old candidate that people are concerned about. You can say Trump is old too, not as old as Biden. And frankly, he comes off as more cogent to many viewers as compared to Biden. And you have this kerfuffle around the debates where Joe Biden seems to want to limit the number of debates, agreeing to two, at a time when he, as the person behind, should be advocating for more opportunities to get in front of the American public and change their minds. So what do you do with that? All, all of that that I've said is coming down mm-hmm. to the central point of this is a Biden problem, not a Democratic problem. So I'm willing to put to the side for a second what happens down ballot. The problem is the risk seems to be truly at the top of the ticket. Disagree. Okay. Um, I Why? disagree with that. Sure. I, I don't think it is a Biden problem. I think it's a Democratic Party problem. I think Democratic why is that? Party's a mess. G- given given that all the other Democrats <laughs> or most of these other Democrats are outperforming Biden, why do you think it's yeah. a Democrat problem? Well, I'm not I'm not letting Biden off the book here. It's not like I'm saying I I, I will incorporate everything you just said. Right? Sure. As, a, as a good lawyer will do. And, you know, I I I, <laughs> I accept that brief. Um, but I'm just going to say, why is has there been a president in modern history who's more the embodiment of the Democratic Party as it currently exists than Joe Biden? I would say no. I think Joe Biden is is part and parcel of what this party is. And it's a mess. 
Um, I wrote a book about it. And and I really strongly believe that the Democratic Party always tries to marginalize its left. Right. It always Mm -hmm. goes for the centrist, even the center right. um, And it it never runs or almost never runs as boldly as it should. And so Joe Biden is I mean, he is what the Democratic Party wants at this point. Not the whole of it. I know there's there's dissidents and, and disagreement. I've written about everybody who's tried to create an alternative, uh, you know. But the fact of the matter is that that the Democratic Party is a is in many ways an old and tired party, and uh, and Joe Biden is is clearly what they've decided that they're going to run with this time. And so I I can't let I I, I can't leave it at that simplistic argument that it's a Biden problem. I think it's a much, much bigger problem. And I think it permeates the party. So that's my view. And I understand that people may disagree. But I think the Democratic Party needs a, a an incredible revolution. Uh, in well, order look, to I, I will argue that yeah. I won't argue that the Democratic Party is um, supporting Joe Biden, that they are defending Joe Biden, that we might not have Joe Biden, but for a party level decision to rally behind him, even if you want to take it back to the 2020 primary, when the the choice to drop out of Pete Buttigieg, A.B. Klobuchar, and all those folks gave us Biden to, in the first place. I mean, certainly that is true. And the reluctance, at least up until this point, we'll see what happens after the first debate, but the reluctance up until this point to consider that there should, might be alternatives to Biden, uh, that there might, that the Democratic Party should maybe support a primary, all mm-hmm. those kinds of things, certainly speaks to the complicity. And I'm not arguing against that in the least. But all that being said, even a Democratic Party that I personally I find disgusting, I have contempt for, I think is liberal and horrible, um, that does nothing but pander to the Nikki Haley voter and um, extremists who are never going to vote Democrat anyway. All that being said, the Democrats not named Joe Biden still seem to be able to convince majorities of voters in their districts to vote for them. Joe Biden, I think uniquely, and again, some of this isn't hit, like entirely fair. I would say like the age point, it's not a substantive critique. It is and it isn't. But let's just say yeah. for a, a second that because he and, and Trump are largely the same age, that it's not a substantive critique. It is a critique that has clearly been motivating voters for over a year now. There was a poll from last oh, yeah. year that showed oh, yeah. something like 75 percent of Democratic voters thought Biden was too old to run and the Democratic Party made the choice to run him anyway. So, yes, you can blame the Democratic Party for that. But that's still a Biden specific problem because Ruben Gallego is not 81. No, right? And Tammy Baldwin is not 81 either. And she's doing great in Wisconsin. Right. I, right. We are not disagreeing. Here. You know, the fact of the matter is that um, there is a you have some desire, and I respect that, to say this is a Biden-centric problem. I have some desire to say this is a Democratic Party-centric problem. Why is that? Why do you have a desire to say it's a Democratic problem? Because it does because seem I'm to a, be the, the... I'm a structuralist, not a personality person. I, I believe that that ultimately personalities, you know, become a part of a party, right? Or a part of an entity, and especially in a two-party system. And because we have this horrible two-party system, which is an absolute nightmare, um, and you know, I was just in Spain where they have a multi-party democracy and you build coalitions. And so people express what they believe in a campaign and then you come out with as many votes as you've got and then you build your coalition. In our two-party system, the coalition is built before the election, right? It is how many people can we get in the camp before the election? And so you dumb down the message, in this case of the Democratic Party, so low that you can try and build that coalition that includes the Nikki Haley voter. It's a mess. And, I'm, you know, I could go on. We could do a whole show on the two party system, which I think is an incredibly disastrous system. But I still remain a structuralist. And so I will argue that Biden is, you know, he is what they want. He is what they voted for. You know, Biden did better in the primaries than people expected. I mean, this is the, the weird thing about it. Um, by and large, John. he ran good numbers. And, and I'm thinking, what? Why was that? Right. I mean, people were given the alternative of uncommitted. Um, They're given the alternative of, you know, admit. Oh, you mean you mean the 2024 primaries? Yeah. yeah. But Biden performed better in the 2024 primaries than people expected when there was no one else running. I mean, all due respect, obviously, I've, I've talked to Marianne and Dean Phillips both on this show. Yeah. 
But all due respect to them, they got a completely media blackout. Most people didn't even know they were running. Was there any expectation that Biden wasn't going to run away with it? I thought I, I was, you know, look, I'm, I'm always hopeful. Right. And it wasn't so much that with the uncommitted movement. And I still remain fascinated by and interested in the uncommitted movement. Um, but the fact of the matter is that that we just can't deny that the Democratic Party, the establishment, the leadership of this party is is overwhelmingly united behind Joe Biden. Right. They're going to go to that convention in Chicago and they're going to they're going to imagine that that this is all good. Right. And I'm just I'm just saying that I think there is a deeper, deeper challenge at the party level. And and that doesn't let Biden off the hook for anything um, or the people around him off the hook for anything. But it does say that this party inclines in this direction. And as a result, 2024 could be the first election of the future. Instead, it's the last election of the past. And we're going to repeat 2020. You know, we're going to repeat the same candidates, same, you know, arguments and stuff like that. And we're, we've got um, two candidates, both Biden and Trump, who are are, you know, candidates of, of the past who really are kind of pushing backward. And and it's it's just not a healthy circumstance for a country. I, I do think that 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 I mean, obviously, I believe the Republican Party should be very different than what it is. But I think the Democratic Party needs to be needs to have a real. I agree with I agree with that, John. But for I, for the sake of this conversation, I'm interested if if you'll indulge me and in talking about why Don, why Joe Biden. Like I can sit here. My whole show is geared around the idea that we hate the Democrats and we don't want the Democratic Party to be the Democratic. Yeah, I don't That's even the hate point. them. The, I just think the, they're unhealthy. Well, I, I do, which is yeah, why this yeah, is a yeah. weird position for me to be in because I loathe them, do not identify as one, and will not be voting for one for the foreseeable future, likely for the rest of my life. But the question at hand is, why is Joe Biden uniquely among Democrats failing so? And I do think that's part of why I wanted to focus on this um, on this Chotner interview, because truly you're seeing the level of denial, the level of yeah. copiousism from the Democratic Party, so much so that the um, interviewer, the interview subject tries to rage quit um, at the gentlest of pushback about this poll point. So Chotner says, uh, as 538 makes clear in their piece, and then he quotes 538 as saying, while the polls in a few closely watched states like Arizona's governorship and Pennsylvania's Senate seat were biased toward Republicans, the polls overall still had a bit of bias toward Democrats. And that's because generic ballot polls, the most common type of uh, poll last cycle, had a weighted average bias of D plus 1.9 and polls of several less closely watched races like the governorships in Ohio and Florida also skewed toward Democrats. The response? I'm ending the interview. I'm ending the interview because what you're doing is ridiculous. Choder says, wait, wait, why? The answer, because I have definitive proof that what you're saying is not true and I don't care. I know what 538 wrote. I live this every day. And so the point is what you're saying is wrong. I'm on record saying that what 538 has written is incorrect and I've given you definitive proof otherwise. So if you just want to keep coming back at this, do it. This has become one of the most ridiculous interviews I have ever done in my professional career. Chotner mm -hmm. contrite, tries to keep the interview going, says, oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> but we get right back to this level of tension a little bit later on in the interview. And when when Chotner tries to get to the bottom of like, can you reckon with the dissonance between you saying that like Trump is a weaker candidate than he was in 2020 mm -hmm. and polls suggesting that people have more positive feelings, how he has better favorables now than he did before, and Biden has worse favorables than he had in 2020. Can you can really address the fact, address the fact that you and others months ago were predicting that once we saw Donald Trump um, convicted of having uh, raped um, uh, Diane, uh, not Diane Carroll, oh my goodness, uh, E. Jean Carroll, or uh, found um, uh, that he had committed financial fraud in New York, or once he's on trial uh, for the um, election interference cases, all of those things would move the public even more against him. In fact, now that the months have passed, we found the opposite to be true. At what point does the Biden administration start making different choices about how it is making its case to the public? And mm -hmm. over and over again, our Hopian fella just keeps dealing out Hopium and saying either denying, just kind of denying or evading the question or saying, well, it's gonna be fine. 
Like it's gonna the debates are gonna be good. Joe Biden's gonna be so strong in the debates, he's, it's gonna be fine. To which Ian Choner says, Well, what do we make of the fact that Biden only wants to do two debates instead of three? Oh, well, uh, they only did two last time, and this isn't Biden's decision. It was Trump that didn't want to do three. Oh, Choner says, No, 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 I fact checked it. It's two. Biden asked for two. They they were gonna do three back in 2020 until uh Trump got COVID. So why is Biden, the one who's the underdog, not wanting to do more debates? And so you're getting into this cycle. The Axios reporting, which I'm sure you're aware of, that also show that Biden does not believe that the polls are accurate, that he does not seem to think that he needs to change anything strategically. All of this seems to be leading the Democrats, who do care if Biden wins, more so than I do, I got to say, into their worst case scenario. We all seem to be able to see it. Ezra Klein Ian Choder, these are not lefties like me. These are not people who are, you know, front loading harsh critiques of the Democratic Party. They're trying to wave white flags of mourning and it's because they want a different outcome. And it seems to be that the Democratic Party just doesn't care. I mean, how do you make sense of that? You're making my point. It seems to be that the Democratic Party doesn't care. I will quote the brilliant host of this show. And that is my point. <laughs> the Democratic Party doesn't care. Um, now I know the grassroots of the party does. I think there are a lot of grassroots folks who care very deeply. I think there are a lot of, there are actually, I hear from all sorts of candidates, members of Congress who care a lot, who are really, really concerned. They just don't say it always publicly. But yeah. the, the fact of the matter is this goes back to my point. Um, and, and I will totally cede to you. It's a Biden problem. I just want you to cede to me. It's a democratic party problem. Well, of right? course it's a democratic party put these problem. Two things together and ultimately Biden exists in in his his narrow space because the democratic party lets its nominee define what the democratic party is and they have done this generationally the, i i see a democratic party problem as being much bigger but the democratic party's immediate problem is that if it weren't biden they could win right and they actually have the opportunity to have you know i mean look the the fact of the matter is if there was a a, a, a groundswell within the Democratic Party at this point saying, you know, look, this we got to have a different candidate, right? Um, at least we'd be having a debate, but we're not having that debate. That debate is not, not, not occurring. Well, let me ask you about this, because I would argue that that's, that's where we're getting to when you're having, when you get Ezra Klein, again. Ezra Klein, I, I love Ezra, he is not defining, but you know, look, I, I got to be honest with you. The fact uh -huh. of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that the overall punditocracy, right? And it's never, in my view, as a structuralist, never look at the media as one entity, you know, saying like, oh, there's this this channel that's saying this or this reporter that's saying this. Never look at the punditocracy as one individual or a couple of individuals. It's always the overall message. And the overall message of the punditocracy is still very parallel to that of the Biden White House, the, the liberal punditocracy. And so I think we're still stuck in the same place. Yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't change the fact that Ezra Klein is usually with the the I, the, the mainstream pun, pun, pundit whatever you want to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, no, but like it, I, of course he's with them. So usually he is not. Yeah, but the fact case. that we're seeing cracks that's the that's the point, John. We're now seeing cracks, and <laughs> moreover, you're getting Axios writing up that this isn't just you know, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times saying that Biden is going to win and he shouldn't worry about anything or you're it, it's it's that he genuinely believes that even at the same time as you have the Pod Save America crew is yeah. lobbying these criticisms at Joe Biden. I mean, it's Which not is, just one or two figures. It's some of the people who have historically been the closest to candidates. Pod Save boys are all former Biden speechwriters and uh, campaign workers. You know, it's people who are normally the folks that um uh, circle the wagons and close ranks yeah. that are the ones calling out. So the, that, this is this. So how do we get to the next stage then? How do we get to the next place? So that's what I want to ask you about. Yeah. How do, do you think there's any actual likelihood? Because this is the theory that's been put forward, that mm -hmm. the reason that Biden wanted these two debates and wanted them to happen when they're happening is that there's this one that's happening before the convention. And there's this argument that says it's a test case for whether or not he has the stamina to make it to the finish line. And depending on how he performs, there might actually be an opening because things are looking so bad, an opening to actually uh, pick a new candidate at the convention. Mm -hmm. I, you know, more power to it, right? I mean, I, I like democracy. I like a process that, that has some uncertainty in it, not, not things locked in, 
And so if if you have a debate before a convention and, and people say, well, I, I'm not sure our guy is up to it. And it's possible, you know, obviously the Republican Party is not going to do that because the Republican Party is now fully the party of Trump. Right. It is it, it has no internal opposition by except for some a couple of little subtleties we could talk about. Um, but in the Democratic Party, if that possibility exists, right, if there can be an open, you know, opening up of the debate, um, you know, I think it'd be fascinating as a reporter. I'd love to cover that. Right. That would be well, how likely do you think it is, though? Uh, very unlikely, extremely unlikely. Um, again, I wrote a book about this and I, and that doesn't make me smarter than anybody else. It just means that I spent, you know, well. a few months, I took a few months off and spent some time looking at something. I fully acknowledge my, my deep imperfections and, and weaknesses in this regard. But in my book, the fight for the soul of the democratic party, I went back 80 years, 80 years ago this summer and began tracing what I think is a pattern within the democratic party that at the end of the day, when there is a very good argument for them to do things differently, they don't, right? They still default to doing the, the safest, in their view, quote unquote, safest, uh, narrowest, most centrist, most corporate, uh, most cautious route. And, and I think it is, it is a, this is baked into the party, right? And so, um, again, I, I think that there, is a, there are huge challenges with Biden, but I think there are huge challenges with the party and so I think the likelihood that you have this opening and this this creation of a space where maybe you'd have a different candidate, I think it is extremely unlikely. Now, with that said, then there is the mm -hmm. next question. Is there any opening to change the course of this history, right? Because we're talking about changing the course of a history, right? One history being written is uh, that we're going to have these two candidates basically in the round of 80 years old running the same campaign they did four years ago, blah, 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 that this is the last campaign of the past. Um, could we change that, i.e. replace one of these candidates, right? And Republicans actually, the Republican, some parts of the Republican establishment actually entertained that idea. They thought, well, maybe we'll replace him with Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis or something like that, right? Because Trump will get in so much legal trouble, somehow he'll get pushed aside. That didn't come to pass because our two-party system doesn't, it's not a very flexible system. Um, so now we're over at looking at the Democrats. Could the Democrats possibly, you know, Walter, I again say very unlikely. So that's that one history. Then there's this other history. Okay, with these two candidates, is it possible that one of the candidates, Joe Biden, the guy we're talking about, would he in any way change, right? Is it possible that he could somehow have a better, not just message, but actually better kind of core going forward? i.e. something that might open this thing up, might, might create a, a broader appeal, right? And that is the big question. The failure of the Biden administration, the deep failure of the Biden administration was, is to live in 1970sism, to think that, that, you know, we're always in this politics of the past and you can't go beyond, you know, like there, there are narrow parameters for how you do things. They failed to recognize that during COVID, America became a social democracy. Not a great social democracy, not a fully realized one, but what were we doing? Giving people money, um, you know, letting people off the hook as regards rent, as regards all sorts of other challenges, trying very, very hard to pump money into the economy, pump money into people so that you could maybe make it through a real catastrophe, right? And uh, we spent a lot of money. And you know what? Real, weirdly enough, it, it didn't crash the economy. It actually, you know, there's a lot of reasons to suggest that when you have a government that's activist and spends a lot of money and tries to do something, it actually accomplishes things, right? So instead of recognizing that and saying, okay, Americans really like this, let's do a whole lot more of that, the Biden administration has essentially said, mm, no, let's go back to doing things the way that we always did, right? Let's go back to the, the narrower game, the compromise game, the accepting of the rules of the Senate so you don't try to get rid of the filibuster the accepting of the reality that there's no way to convince Joe Manson, Manchin or Kristen Cinema to do the right thing, the accepting of the quote unquote reality that you can't get Lisa Murkowski to come over on, on a whole bunch of stuff as you should be able to because Alaska actually has strong unions, blah, blah, blah. All these things. They just, they didn't fight the fight in the way that they needed to fight the fight because they weren't fighting for the right goal, which is, to have a, a, a government that is dramatically more activist, that really does tax the rich, that really does tax corporations, that really does move resources toward 
big, big goals. So we accept that that's the, and, and you may disagree with me, but to me, that's a huge part of the crisis. Then you get to this campaign and it is, what would make us think that Joe Biden might be better now than he was when he had power? Well, subtlety of politics, candidates are always better as candidates than when they are in power. They, they always promise more than what they, they deliver. Um, and so in that case, it is in Biden's own self-interest to promise more, to offer more, to be, to be better, to, to go further. And what is jarring to me is they aren't even trying to do that. This is a big deal. They're not out there saying, you know, making all the excuses, blah, 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 and then saying, but give us power and here's what we want to do. Here's the bigger thing that we want to do. And I think a lack of bigness is a scorching crisis. A lack of huge, bold vision is a scorching crisis at this point. And, and it is, I, I genuinely think that the Biden people want to win small. They don't want to win big. And as a result, their satisfaction with winning small is not just a crisis for Biden, because he could well lose small, um, but it's a crisis for the party and for politics in this country. And and that takes us over to one last thing. And then, you know, I don't want to filibuster here, um, but also the Gaza issue. Right. Because Gaza is so clearly a moral issue, first and foremost, but also a political issue. And the failure to recognize that, right? I mean, to literally go out there and say, you know, Donald Trump is an existential threat to American democracy. He is a threat to freedom. He's a threat to everything. Um, but we're not going to just on something where clearly the people and clearly the world community, everybody says we're wrong. We're not going to just on that, right? Even though it, 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 for a variety of reasons, might help us beat Trump, right? They, they, they refuse to move. On, on, on essential things, on, on fundamental moral issues as well as political issues. And so that scares me. So I think I think the, the dissonance we're having is that I don't have any expectation that the Democratic Party is going to realize that by being basically Bernie Sanders, it could win. I have lived long enough and experienced the pain of what they'll do to a Bernie Sanders to not even think for a second about, well, if they actually supported Medicare for all, then that what a popular policy and wouldn't that be great for them? We're like so far past that. Mm -hmm. What is interesting to me at this point, I, I don't have any hope for the Democratic Party. I'm not interested in the Democratic Party. I think it was a mistake with all due respect for Marianne Williamson to run within the Democratic Party. I think that to the extent that leftists are interested in electoral politics, they should be working on building third parties and redirecting their energy into the one existing left uh, third party, which is the Green Party. That being said, what's interesting to me is that Democrats also don't seem to have the sense of self-preservation. And I don't think they have to be Bernie Sanders to win this election. I think they could take out Joe Biden and replace him with a younger Joe Biden, i.e. someone like a Gavin Newsom, or frankly, even Dean Phillips, generic Democrat mm. wins where Joe Biden fails. And that's why I'm so interested in the conversation around a convention, because at this point, yeah. despite what uh, Rosenberg seems to think, our Hopium friend, mm -hmm. the polls are getting to a point where it looks like there's no coming back for Joe Biden. You know, anything's possible. And I under but I understand that an argument that goes something like it has never been the case that an incumbent was successfully challenged in the primary and then went on to win uh, the general election. I can understand an argument that says, so as bad as it gets for Biden, we might as well just not change horses in midstream. But if you're also at a point that says there has never been an incumbent with favorables that are this low and polls that are this bad, this close to the election that has already won, well, now you're in two losing scenarios. Mm -hmm. And there's an argument that says, well, we might as well just mix things up and see what happens because there's always a first time for everything. And mm -hmm. let's, you know, if, if Biden is a sure, surefire loser, then what's the harm in expediting Gavin Newsom's eventual presidential run and trying to see if we can get a, a get a baton handoff 
at the convention. And so I am curious with your historical perspective about why you so pointedly discount the possibility of that happening and also what you actually think of the potential success of a maneuver like that, even if you think it's unlikely. Well, I think it's unlikely. I don't discount it. I mean, I want to strongly emphasize, I think it's a great idea to to have to have a, a convention of a political party actually be a convention, right? Which we haven't had mm. since, you know, in the modern age. Neither of us have been alive when there was an actual convention uh, where people came from across the country from a lot of different perspectives and they fought it out on the floor mm. um, and, and tried to, to nominate A, someone that they liked. That's always good. And B, someone that they thought could win. Um, yeah. So we haven't had that in the modern age. But, um, boy, I don't there's nothing in me that's against that. I love that idea. The reason I am skeptical about it happening is because there have been so many attempts over the years to do it and it has failed. What what kind of attempts? Sure. 1968 is a great example. Right. And, and you know, Biden clearly has a 1968 phobia. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a, they fear Chicago. They're going to Chicago for a convention and they're afraid. Of, of being in Chicago, street demonstrations and stuff like that. But what they should be afraid of is not protests in the streets. What they should be afraid of is a repeat of what happened in Chicago in 1968 inside the convention hall. Because inside the convention hall, what the Democratic Party decided to do was nominate Hubert Humphrey, the vice president of Lyndon Johnson. And they passed over Eugene McCarthy, who had actually won a bunch of primaries, who was the anti-war candidate, who had gone out that summer, by the way, and people, this is lost to history, but Eugene McCarthy, after the primaries were done and after Bobby Kennedy Jr. was shot and killed, um, McCarthy went out and did a, a, a tour of the country, not for primaries, right, but to show the level of support for an alternative, right, to even though the party mm -hmm. establishment didn't want him. And they filled stadiums. I mean, it was just, you, you can't begin to imagine the hundreds of thousands of people that, that put, pour their heart and soul into saying, let's try and let's try and wrestle this party out of it, out of its doomed trajectory, right? Out of its trajectory toward failure. And um, they got to that convention and, and absolutely refused. They refused an anti-war plank. They refused, you know, a, a, you know, visionary proposals for how to do all sorts of different things. And they nominated Humphrey and he lost. Now, he didn't lose by much. Frankly, the fact of the matter is America at that time was was more prepared, I think, than a lot of people thought to vote for a liberal Democrat or for a Democrat over Richard Nixon and George Wallace. But it didn't work. The party snatched defeat from the jaws of victory at that convention. Now that you'll say, oh, well, that was the old party, right? It was before they did the McGovern reforms of 72 and stuff like that. But let's look at 1980. 1980, Jimmy Carter, who I love, right? I adore Jimmy Carter. He is a great ex-president of the United States. He is, I've interviewed him. I, I just, you know, I'm going to go to my grave saying wonderful things about Jimmy Carter. But in 1980, he couldn't win. Ted Kennedy ran against him. And the interesting thing is that Kennedy's campaign was a mess starting out. So he lost some early primaries. But as it got going, he started to win. And by the time he got to that convention, if you go back and listen to Kennedy's speech, it was electric, right? And, mm. and the, everybody knew this is the guy we should be nominating. Right. This is a better prospect, even though he had all of his imperfections. This is a better prospect. Didn't even think of it. Right. Didn't even didn't come near happening. And and I can keep going through, you know, and we go right up to Sanders in 16. We can look at, you know, all sorts of examples where it's very, very clear that the party has a route that could win and it doesn't choose that route. And so um, that's my that it is only history that causes me to be skeptical at this point. And believe me, if there's anyone you will meet who believes strongly that history can, you know, we can put it in a box and we can move to a new place, right? That's me. I really believe it. So if indeed there's a series of factors that begin to, to make it possible um, to open things up and to have this broader debate, I, I couldn't celebrate it more. But I do want to emphasize that, that realistically, I think it's hard to get there because the party itself makes it hard to get there. In the Carter and Humphrey examples, I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but I'll do my best. what were the polls looking like as compared to where Biden is now? Bad. They were bad. 
you know, I similarly mean, bad, worse or better I mean, than Biden. I'd have to now. look. I'd have to take a serious look. But Carter was definitely in trouble. I mean, there was Carter was in trouble like a year out. I mean, it was and it was getting worse. So there's a pretty good example. I, I we could look at him and, and find some comparable places. It might not have been as bad as Biden. But remember, Carter was dealing not just with um, an, a hostage situation in, in Iran. He was also dealing with inflation that was at scorching levels, makes what we're talking about now seem like child's play. Um, and, and there was just a, there was, even he acknowledged a malaise in the country, right? And so it was, it was a bad situation with Humphrey, Humphrey, it's just, I mean, Humphrey was the vice president of a president who quit because things were so bad, right? So Mm -hmm. this is, it'd be like, like, you know, you're the assistant of somebody and the person says, wow, this, this thing's going down. I'm leaving. You take charge. Right. And that's what they did to Humphrey. Humphrey didn't even run in the primaries. Humphrey went to the convention without delegates who had been elected to vote for him or chosen to vote for him. He, it was just the machine said, oh no, you know, we're, we're going with what we got. And, and the tragedy of that is, I mean, it's such a deep tragedy. Um, and I guess this is how we ought to look at our politics. You know, we ought to look at that. And this goes to your point of, of the current moment. We should always look at, at, you know, what we lost by not trying something bigger. Um, in 1944, when they passed over Henry Wallace for the vice presidency, knowing that, that uh, Franklin Roosevelt was in very, very poor health, um, we lost the possibility of a president of the United States. And I know there's people who say horrible things about Wallace and that he was, you know, a communist or whatever. He wasn't. Um, uh, we had a potential of a president who was anti-racist and anti-sexist and in favor of seeking, in a serious-minded way, seeking global peace, being president of the United States in 1945. An Mm anti-racist president in 1945 who literally said, segregation's got to end now. Mm -hmm. We lost 20 years, 25 years of, of what could have been, right? You know, of yeah. progress of, of fighting that fight in the 1940s, not in the 1960s, right? And if people say, "Well, we weren't ready for it," well, Henry Wallace was ready for it, and they passed him over narrowly. Okay, 1968. Let me just one more example there. 1968. Please. What did you have in 1968? You had the Civil Rights Act of 64, 65. You said civil rights, voting rights, all the progress there, and people tend to stop there, but they don't realize you also had the war on poverty. You had, which was actually being developed out in a real way. You had a vision for um, massive reform of our media, the creation of an American BBC. That was a part of what Johnson was talking about in that period. You had a vision of massive reform of how we funded politics, i.e. getting money out of politics, not in 2025, right? But in 1967, a whole plan to get money out of politics. And by the way, to give fair funding and fair options to third parties. To actually look at the possibility of multi multi party democracy, this was real in 1966, 1967, because the country country was ready for it. There was a there was great demands in play. Um, Bill Moyers, who was uh, Lyndon Johnson's spokesman, will tell you that in that period um, there was really a sense that America was moving in the direction of social democracy on a whole bunch of levels. Johnson blew it by falling for the Cold War domino theory Vietnam scenario got us into that terrible mess. This is Johnson, a very imperfect figure. I'm not trying to make him into a perfect hero, but I'm saying that's where we ended up. That derailed his presidency. Tet Offensive in February of 68, by you know the end of March of 68, Johnson says, I'm out of here, I'm, I'm quitting. So then we end up, instead of saying, okay, how do we make sure that this doesn't just continue, but it gets better, right? That we end the war and get back focused on a, on a domestic agenda that will truly get us someplace. Right. That is good. That is, you know, that is progress. Um, They said, nope, we're going to we're going to nominate his vice president. Right. We're just going to he isn't running. We're going to run somebody who was his you know, wingman. It was a terrible, terrible choice. What what do you think motivated it? What? It's the Democratic Party. They. But but, but, but I'm asking you this because, I mean, there are worlds where I mean, in this case, it's Ted Kennedy and. You know, is it that Ted Kennedy was too progressive for the moment, like the way you might or sorry, who who was who was the alternative? I don't I'm lost track a little bit of which one. In 68, it was Gene McCarthy. It's Gene, um, OK. Yeah. In, in 80, it was Ted Kennedy. And but so in, 
Yeah, what I'm what I'm arguing like it, to analogize it to the contemporary scenario. Yeah, there's a world where I if we're talking about 2016. Yeah, Bernie, it, it's better to lose than to have the socialist in the office. I, I get that argument. That that seems to be obviously what happened. But right now, I'm not even thinking personally in terms of my hopes and dreams. I'm simply thinking about what what is the Democratic Party thinking with their own interests, and 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 just sub out someone they love, but just who isn't Biden, who doesn't have some of these like. Care in, you know, in um, immutable characteristics like age that they're mm-hmm. having a hard time getting around. To your very good point. To your very good point. Um, there was a lot of evidence in 68 that McCarthy pulled much better, right? That he had a much better chance of winning. They didn't do it. They didn't. Self preservation did not trump, to use the terrible word, um, internal politics, right? Traditional politics. Um, in 80, a similar scenario. And and I, I again, I don't want to always be the historian here because you know there's you live but please in the do I'm, I'm interested. Well, in nineteen remember this in nineteen seventy two we had uh, George McGovern ran for president of the United States and he was he was an act, actually a very very good candidate in a whole bunch of ways. World War II war hero, pilot shot down, fought his way you know out from behind the lines. I mean there's, the story's great. But McGovern was way too modest, of course, uh, but he was running on a on a anti war. Uh, platform and a, a visionary domestic policy platform, right? Talking about healthcare for all, et cetera, and stuff like that. Um, what did you get? Democrats for Nixon. Literally a huge portion of the Democratic Party mm-hmm. literally left and formed a group called Democrats for Nixon that included members of Congress, governors, others who were backing the Republican to avoid letting the progressive actually run a viable campaign. McGovern might not have won, but he would have done a lot better if the Democratic Party had just said you know, even the AFL-CIO didn't back McGovern in 72. So mm. you had this crisis scenario, right, where the party's like pulling and scratching and doing all this stuff. So then you have Watergate. The Democratic Party says, OK, we have to have a lot more internal democracy. 68 was a mess. 72, we got all these derailed. So we're going to have internal democracy. We're going to have mid-year conventions in 74, 78. They had mid-year conventions. You know what happened? Democratic socialists were on the march. At the 78 mm. mid-year convention, there was a group called Democratic Agenda. Uh, led by Michael Harrington, but with the support of the UAW, the steelworkers, the machinists and others, they went to the midterm convention with a vision for, um, you know, expanding the social welfare state for, uh, you know, jobs programs for a really progressive vision, not perfect, but a progressive vision. And they got within a whisker at this midterm convention of of getting that agenda approved against the, the pressure of the Carter administration and a young you know, Democratic activist Hillary Clinton, who was on on the floor there pushing the, the other direction, um, mm-hmm. they got so close. And one person, one leading person in the party said, you know what? These folks are right. Ted Kennedy said, you know, I, I like what Democratic agenda is doing here. You know, I want to take that into the the 80 campaign. And um, look, the bottom line is that with all of his imperfections, all of his flaws, and I'm, I'm not a Ted Kennedy, you know, flag waver or anything like that. But uh, he was right. That was the energetic alternative to where Carter was at at that point, i.e. for the party to make a change, move in this this bolder direction. And they absolutely rejected it. They absolutely said, we're just not going to go there. And and now, do I think necessarily that Kennedy would have beat Reagan in 80? I can't guarantee you that. Do I think Kennedy would have done much better and perhaps electrified something, made something real? I do. Hmm. I can keep going through scenarios. We could go all night. Um, 88, they had a chance. Jesse Jackson had gone out and electrified the nation in the primaries. In 88, Dukakis, a, a managerial, relatively liberal Democrat. I mean, compared to who we have now, he's much more liberal in a lot of ways. But a managerial hmm. Democrat, pretty boring guy, right? He had a choice. He could pick a vice presidential nominee, right? It was very open. He could have picked Jesse Jackson who was all about expanding the electorate, who had just had this remarkable campaign that had electrified the country, who had just delivered one of the greatest convention speeches in history. Young America, hold your head high now. We can win. You must never stop dreaming. Face reality, yes, but don't stop with the way things are. Dream of things as they ought to be. Dream, face pain. But love, hope, faith, and dreams will help you rise above the pain. Use hope and imagination as weapons of survival and progress. But you keep on dreaming, young America. Dream of peace.
Peace is rational and reasonable. War is irrational in this age and unwinnable. Dream of teachers who teach for life and not for living. Dream of doctors who are concerned more about public health than private wealth. Dream of lawyers more concerned about justice than the judgeship. Dream of preachers who are concerned more about prophecy than profiteering. Dream on the high road with sound values. We must never surrender to inequality. Women cannot compromise ERA or comparable work. Women are making 60 cents on the dollar for what a man makes. Women cannot buy meat cheaper. Women cannot buy bread cheaper. Women cannot buy milk cheaper. Women deserve to get paid for the work that you do. It's right and it's fair. I'm often asked, Jesse, why do you take on these tough issues? They're not very political. We can't win that way. If an issue is morally right, it will eventually be political. It may be political and never be right. Fannie Lou Hamer didn't have the most votes in Atlantic City. Well, the principals have outlasted every delegate who voted to lock her out. Rosa Parks did not have the most votes, but she was morally right. Dr. King didn't have the most votes about the Vietnam War, but he was morally right. If we're principled first, our politics will fall in place. When you see Jesse Jackson, when my name goes in nomination, your name goes in nomination. I was born in the slum, but the slum was not born in me. And it wasn't born in you, and you can make it. Wherever you are tonight, you can make it. Hold your head high. Stick your chest out. You can make it. It gets dark sometimes, but the morning comes. Don't you surrender. Suffering breeds character. Character breeds faith. In the end, faith will not disappoint. You must not surrender. You may or may not get there, but just know that you are qualified and you hold on and hold out. We must never surrender. America will get better and better. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Even people who didn't like him were saying, that's amazing, right? No, no, no. We're going with Lloyd Benson, who is literally the only man in American politics more boring than Michael Dukakis, right? And, yeah. and so I, I just want to emphasize to you, this yeah. is a party with a problem. And its problem is that, that even when self-preservation argues for doing the bolder thing, right? At the very least, yeah. nominate Jesse Jackson for vice president. They're like, mm -mm, not going to do that. And I'll give you one final example. I mean, I know we could go forever. Let's bring it up to 2016. Um, do you remember who Hillary Clinton's vice presidential nominee was? Uh, yeah, uh, Tim Kaine in the membrane. Very good. That's very good. <laughs> You're probably the only one, only person in America who does remember. Um, well, no, I remember because I was livid on the Internet back yeah. when my only outlet was tweeting uh, during my day job. Uh, about how there was all of this uh, beating up on so-called Bernie bros for not caring about the interest of women when you had this it, when you had her go and pick a not pro-choice um, vice presidential running mate who had a terrible record on women's issues. Well, and also like right to work. Yeah, he'd been governor of a of a southern state. He hadn't changed right to work. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like there's a lot there, right? A lot to object to. And, yeah. and so here you have 2016 and, um, and you just had this, this Sanders revolution. If people can like Bernie Sanders, they can dislike him. Okay. Put that where it is. But they had this, this thing where, you know, Sanders really took off, right? Everybody was into this. There was just this energy there. You get to the convention, say, well, we're not going to nominate Bernie Sanders for vice president, right? Because there's no way the establishment is going to go that far. But could we nominate somebody who could capture some of that energy? Right? Could we, you know, take a chance on on something that's a little bolder? And and 
you know, are there options out there? Shared Brown, maybe not perfect, yeah. but you know, somebody's a closer to the closer to the energy. My goodness, could Sherrod Brown maybe, maybe have won Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin for the Democrats just by being a very yeah. pro-labor guy? Could he maybe even made Ohio closer? Yes. But they're like, no, 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 no. no uh, 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 uh. Um, <laughs> could they have even picked, I mean, could they picked Elizabeth Warren, right? And run two women, which, by the way, would in no way harm the ticket, right? It would help, right? It, there'd be an energy there. No, 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 no. We need yeah. to find a very boring Southern white guy. And that's what they did, you know? And so uh, I just, and I'm not even beating up on Tim Kaine. He's got a relatively good record on the death penalty, but I'm just saying that he was practically the wrong candidate in that race. And, and we can go through the history again and again and again, cycle after cycle, circumstance after circumstance, and at some point, what we have to recognize is that while the Democratic Party may do a somewhat bold thing in a, in a critical moment, Obama in 08, as an example, kind of moving a little bit beyond, you know, its usual space. By and large, when it's in a, a critical testing, you know, where, where things are really intense, where, as we're talking about now, where you should make a bold choice, right? You should try something. Uh, you should always be open to possibility. And I, by the way, Hold out again those two avenues of possibility. One is a different candidate. Two is a different approach from Biden, right? A recognition that that you can't, you know, I'll, I'll give you both of those options, right? As, as ways, one being a much, you know, more cautious option. I just say, I don't, I wish I could tell you that I thought the Democratic Party would do that. I don't see so let me, much possibility. Let me ask you this if the Democrats don't care about winning, enough to act out of self-preservation. Why should leftists be invested in mm. the outcome mm. of the election? Oh, yeah. Because we've heard already the left punching has begun, mm -hmm. even though polls demonstrate that New York Times article from maybe now two weeks ago show that the people who are fleeing the Biden coalition aren't actually the left, despite Gaza, despite it all, despite uncommitted, that it's these centrist voters that Chuck Schumer told us he was going to pick up in, in suburban Pennsylvania or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And yet the focus still seems to be when the Democrats lose on leftists not towing the line or uh, the left is blamed for influencing Joe Biden into being FDR. <laughs> and he's such a progressive. He loved, you know, he's defunded all the police, as the saying goes. And so yeah. it's ultimately our fault. So and there, a lot of leftists, by the way, do respond to that peer pressure. Mm -hmm. I had a debate with um, two people I respect a great deal, uh, mm -hmm. Crystal and Kyle Kalinske, Crystal Ball and Kyle Kalinske, uh, last summer before October 7th, mm -hmm. um, during which they argue that um, not only that Joe Biden's kind of positive moves on labor with the NLRB were sufficient to for him to deserve uh, the left's vote over a Green Party candidate, um, but also that it would hurt the left to withhold our votes and vote for, say, a Jill Stein, uh, because we would get blamed and that that would make us have less leverage going forward. But it does seem to me, given all that you've described, where it's very clear, as you've laid out the history, that it is liberals who won't get out of their own way, who I would rather lose than entertain the idea of someone even who's a little bit more to the left and more popular, or even someone who is not any more to the left, like a Gavin Newsom, but is simply younger, then why should, or let me ask you, should leftists continue to internalize the idea that we have to keep trying to curry favor with the liberal establishment by falling in line, as opposed to, let's say, voting for a Green Party candidate, helping them get to 5% of the vote, getting them automatic at automatic ballot access in a world where the Democratic Party spends millions of dollars to try to keep them off the ballot and make it more likely in subsequent generations that we actually have a candidate we believe in to vote for. Okay. Um, again, a lot on the table there and and a little hard to go know exactly where to where to kind of jump in. But what I will say is this, the left should always advocate for what it seeks, right? And, and this, is, this is an important thing. Um, one of the biggest dangers as regards democratic politics, not talking about multi-party politics, which is you know, ultimately you know, something that is far healthier as regards uh, any democracy, 
But but in our current circumstance, and as the tragedy, I think our current circumstance is pretty locked in uh, without a lot of a lot of changes. And I think you're more optimistic on that. And I respect that. But um, but the left does no favors to Joe Biden or to the Democratic Party by going along, right? By simply saying, yes, this is, you know, we, we're going to temper our critique or we're going to ask for less. Um, at this point, Biden, within the Democratic Party, Biden's candidacy would be better if the left was pushing harder, right? And and for whatever it was pushing for. Um, I happen to think it should be pushing for um, a, a, a radical shift in policy as regards to Gaza. Uh, Aren't they? Aren't we? No, no, it is. I'm not saying it isn't. But what I'm saying is that's what that is. But more broadly, I think people who even kind of, you know, liberals ought to be, you know, this is, that, that's a pretty simple moral stance, right? It, it, it should be a much, I think there should be, should there be a platform vote on, on you know, endorsing a Palestinian state and, and you know, really shifting policy? Yes, I think there should. Um, but should there be that? Um, should there also be a push for 32 hour a week? Um, should there be push for a whole bunch of changes that are really, really big? And should the left look at the Democratic Convention as a place to put a host of issues in play, right? And to try and fight for those issues, whoever the nominee is, right? And again, the understanding all these dynamics, it absolutely should be. And my, my fear at this point, genuine fear, is that, that, um, that an awfully lot of folks will kind of you know, circle into the, well, you know, it's getting, we're getting towards summer, can't criticize Biden or the party at this point, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's not healthy. It's not good. It's okay to have people who say, I am fundamentally at odds with where this president and this party is, but I'm going to vote for him. Okay. I understand that. Now, that may not be where you are, and I understand that. What I'm saying is, it's okay if you're there, if you're saying, but I'm not going to simply accept how they run. I'm not going to accept that, that, that I've got to reflect where, where this candidate is. And, and to give you an example of how that, that can and should work, I hate to go so far back in history, right? But when the Democratic Party had its biggest victory in American history was 1936, right? It was Roosevelt's second, second term. It was the election that baked in the best of the New Deal. It was the election that, that changed America so fundamentally that we had to wait till 1980 for Ronald Reagan to start to undo a lot of it, right? Um, it wasn't perfect. I'm not a New Deal fabulous, but I'm saying it was a big deal win. Do you know what happened in 1936? You had a left that was actually aggressively criticizing Roosevelt throughout that process, some of whom did not vote for him, some of whom voted for you know, alternative candidates of the left, socialists, communists, others, right? Many of whom ultimately did vote for Roosevelt, but did, though, did so via um, alternative routes, i.e., you know, the the nascent American Labor Party in New York State, um, and also the Progressive Party in Wisconsin, the Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota, the Nonpartisan League in North Dakota. They didn't have always a, uh, a situation where you had dual ballot lines or something like that, but they had a circumstance where, you know, you had these, these to the left of the Democratic Party groupings that said, Roosevelt is insufficient. What the Democrats are doing is not right. However, we're going to end up we're, a lot of our people, maybe not full endorsements, but a lot of our people are going to end up backing him. But we're going to we're, we're going to demand much more and we're going to push it you know, to get our support, to get our support. You've got to mm -hmm. do a whole lot more. And you know what happened? Roosevelt actually changed to become acceptable to his left, not to the center and the right. And so yeah. what was Roosevelt's last speech? of the 1936 campaign. I want to emphasize, do you know what people said about Franklin Roosevelt in 1936? He doesn't look very healthy, mm -hmm. right? He's, his presidency has really worn this guy out. He's looking kind of, and he was much younger, but but he had had a lot of health challenges and stuff like that. They had all the critiques, stuff like blah, blah, blah. In his last speech of the campaign, this is on, on Halloween night, 1936, Roosevelt's at Madison Square Garden. New York City was the, the in many ways, not the only, but one of the great bases of the left at that point. You really did have 
you know, socialists, communists, all sorts of other folks who were very, very much to the left of where Roosevelt was. So he's up there at this huge event, final event, a couple of days before the election. What does he say? You know the answer because you know your history well. He said, um, look, the bankers are against me. Wall Street's against me. They all want to stop what we've done. And they want to stop us from going further, from locking this in and doing something much bolder. And what did Roosevelt say? He said, I welcome their hatred. Right. That was a message to the left. It was literally saying to his left, you know, if you give me another chance here, you give me another four years, I am going to double down. I'm going to take all that criticism, all that, you know, attacks, some legit, some not. And I'm going to do better. I'm going to do more. And yeah. why did that happen? It didn't happen because Roosevelt's a great guy. It, didn't. it happened because Roosevelt, even at that late stage, was scared enough to say, I got to get I got to get the votes to my left. I've got to I've got to mobilize something much bigger. And and yeah. the fact of the matter is. You and I may differ on some. And I, I have so much respect for you that I, when, when I differ with you, I always think I may be wrong. Um, but <laughs> same, same. No, but you and I may differ on some of this. And that's OK. That's that's a healthy left to have people differing. Right. And to have people, you know, debating these things. But but what what I don't think we differ on is the notion that a, a tempered left, uh, a softened left, a, uh, a left that is simply willing to go along um, never gets anywhere. It doesn't it doesn't. Achieve. That is we absolutely agree on that. And, you know, frankly, so there's a two things. So to, to that, exactly that point, it's part of why I was frustrated. I'm frustrated when there are, you know, leftists with big audiences who, you know, over a year before an election would say we should vote for Joe Biden, right? So to me, like just strategically, even if ultimately you and your personal capacity plan to do so because you think democracy is at stake and all of those kinds of things, or because you think the NLRB is good or whatever it is, I don't think strategically it makes a lot of sense to admit that, especially when you're not just an individual, but you are someone who is perceived or potentially perceived as being influential to what a lot of other voters on the left are going to do. So how are you ever going to get the bolus of people to push, to, to make him do it, as it were, mm -hmm. um, if if the lead, the people who are perceived as leaders of your movement in the absence of any other kind of a leader are basically admitting that they're going to vote for Biden no matter what? Now, I'm Can very I pleased. Interrupt? Can I interrupt you? Yeah, go ahead. I, I apologize. Yeah. I, only because I want to put an exclamation mark on what you just said. And mm -hmm. then you know, pray that you're smarter and better than me and can remember your second point, uh, <laughs> which I often fail. Um, but but uh, it didn't it wasn't for a long time. But Sean Fain and the UAW withheld their endorsement. Yeah. Right. Now, they ultimately but then they didn't. I know. Right? But, 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 but but this is still an exclamation mark on your point, yeah. because they withheld their endorsement and then they went into a major strike. The point they went yeah. into their major strike. Many of the unions had already endorsed Biden, right? Do you think that influenced Biden? I do. I think that Biden was more inclined to join that picket line to to, you know, make the extra effort because here's a union who that he really needed, right? In Michigan, especially, but in Ohio, Pennsylvania, other states, et cetera. Um, so it, that withholding of an endorsement, even for a period, a small in that pace, a very small period of time, I think had a profound I, I think that's true, but it's also true that like at the same time that the with endorsement was being withheld, we we're also getting these great statements about Palestine solidarity. And then once mm -hmm. you do endorse without any leverage to enforce what has become one of the greatest humanitarian issues of our time, it does. I think it, it has a dual effect of also undermining the credibility of that with with withholding. I, 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 I and again, I don't I think a longer withhold is a more powerful withhold, right? And yes, I think that but ultimately, it, yeah. if it becomes just a game of I'm going to wait until, you know, he, he still endorsed, what, in like January, February? It was like yeah. 10 months until the election. And and so here's, but here's my point, though. It is, um, you don't just withhold for the sake of withholding because it's some sort of play that you're involved. I, I agree. You but, withhold, but that's what oh, I'm I know you. I know you agree. Um, but what I'm saying is, you withhold in an effort to get something, to get movement, to get change. 
Um, that is why the uncommitted movement in the primaries was so, it, had, it continues to be, by the way, I think the uncommitted movement is going to get a very big vote in, in New Jersey in a few days. Um, and, and why, you know, it's one delegates, right? Why it is such an important thing is because here are people who are literally saying, you know, we don't like where this is going and we are going, we're, we're not giving up on this process. We are actively seeking to, to send this message. And did it, did it resonate at all? People are going to debate about that. I think Biden has clearly made some movement because of what uncommitted, because of those uncommitted votes. What is what mo- what does that movement look like? Oh, John? I, I, you know what you know exactly what I'm saying. It's rhetorical, I, I, largely. Yeah, but um, that's bullshit. <laughs> I'm not. Too, that I'm doesn't not. help us. At least it helps us. Just like Biden joining that picket line helped us. That he gets a he gets a newspaper headline saying he's the first president to join a picket line and ever or since whenever it was ever it was ever but yeah. but what is that what did that actually do Th- i mean this is my point and and to and to have said oh we stand with palestine but i'm going inter- to i'm going to endorse the guy who's literally sending billions of dollars in bombs that are being dropped on a refugee a tent city in in rafa what does that actually mean you've completely undermined your own point yeah it, 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 but Still, I think the un- uncommitted vote has been very, very important. And I think it, it continues to be very, very important. And I well, that's that's where we get back to this Ezra Klein and Chotner stuff, yeah. because this is the, this is what I'm trying to drill down to. At, and then this is what was my sec- my second point was going okay. to be on one level. I am like frustrated with the left for not wanting to hold the line more and all of that stuff. And I'm happy when they finally come around to joining me and saying we're not going to vote for Biden, even if it took a genocide to do it. OK, great. Fine. I won't look a gift horse in the mouth. The more cynical part of me thinks, even with the left all aligned, incredibly threatened to threatening to withhold our votes and guaranteeing, frankly, Biden's loss, even if all of that were possible and that we were organized and we made our pitch and Biden said no and he lost. I what from what we're learning about all of the inside conversations with the Axios reporting and Biden being in such denial about what his poll numbers are really like, uh, ignoring the uncommitted vote, the uh, empty virtue signaling of his commencement speech at Morehouse, the disrespect that he's shown to his base, the you know, all of the things down the line, there's a there's a kind of delusion, a, a kind of insanity, a, a total like indifference to the world around you that is coming across in some of these pieces that makes me think that we're so far beyond leverage. We're so far beyond vote withholding at this point because the, the history that you told just told is a history of the Democratic Party that does not care if it loses. It just doesn't, either because it's delusional or because it would rather lose than to uh, move to the left. Whatever the reason, it clearly just doesn't care. And we cannot care more than they care. It gets us nowhere, right? I, the only place where I might differ on that is to say, I'm not sure that they don't care whether, about losing. I just think that they think they can win small, right? I think they, I think they, they, they live in this, this, this bubble where they think they can win. Right. And they think it's all going to come together. And you and you cited some very good examples of that. But I don't think it's that they don't care about losing. I just don't think they are being rational about the circumstance that they're in. Right. They're not. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Like, like, I don't mean to be like, you know, whatever, on PC about this. But if you are not. If you are senile, like if you are not cogent. Then I like, why am I arguing with the crazy person? Why am I why am I trying to bargain with the with the crazy person if they're not rational? Well, you know what I mean? Look, then, no, then I, well, look, how does that affect the left strategy in terms of getting what it wants? It, it is again, it is again this great structural battle, right? It is a battle to make a political party better than itself, better than what it has been. And the fact of the matter is that I think there were many times where it came very, very close, right? Where it could have, by, by just a, 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 a smidgen. In fact, if there's anything in the histories that I've written on some of these fights, it is that it's much more depressing than it sounds in the, in the you know, like quick scenario. Because what you realize is that when you look deeper, that it was, it was a close fight. It was almost possible to get it right. And, and it didn't, right? It turned out wrong. And so there is always this question, and I mean, admittedly, and you can you can disagree and will perhaps, but but there's always this question of, is there another way that is there a way in? Can we find our way to get it right this time? Right? Can we 
Can we figure out how to do it? Now, I fully recognize that that may be literally taking these glasses off and putting the rose colored ones on, right? You know, believing in, in possibilities. And yet at some point, um, I, I think that, that what I'm interested in is politics. And I think politics can operate on many different levels and in many different ways. There could be third party politics. There can be two party politics. There's, you know, people will choose their route. They will choose their way. I never beat people up for choosing the route that they want to go, right? Um, and choosing what they think is the best route. But what I would say is for those who choose the route of the Democratic Party, right, who choose they're going to they're going to ultimately vote for Biden, um, who choose the route of the Democratic Party, do not think that the Democratic Party knows what it's doing, right? Do not think that you are jumping onto a train that has a uh, an engineer who who knows the route and knows how to get there. It doesn't. The fact of the matter is that if you're going to commit to backing Joe Biden for reelection, recognize that there's more to it than that, that you have to demand that the Democratic Party be dramatically different and better than what it has been. Yeah, because that train is Snowpiercer. You're on Snowpiercer yeah, yeah, exactly. and it's not good. <laughs> it's, it's dystopian. <laughs> you're right. And let me <laughs> offer you one other notion, too that that commitment may be to a party with someone other than Biden, right? I mean, all this, I, we put all this into the mix, but what I'm saying is only that if one makes that commitment, if that is the choice they make, not the choice you make, not the choice many other people make, but if that's the choice they make, they can't just imagine that Joe Biden and the people around him know what they're doing. That's ridiculous. A political party ought to be about more than simply the person at the top. It ought to be more than a cult of personality. We criticize the Republican Party for being a Trump cult of personality. And yet so many people make the Democratic Party into something very similar to that. That's absurd at this point. And so putting demands on the Democratic Party, putting radical demands on the Democratic Party in return for support, that is, that's baseline requirement. That's baseline requirement. I think that's right. I am, you know, I'm the I'm the queen of vote withholding. I wrote this piece back in 2020 about um, litmus tests and how you got to have some. And if there were an organized effort to say we can guarantee this many votes, if you mm -hmm. adopt this uh, agenda, it could really help us to shift the narrative from being blamed for uh, Democrats' losses to feeling the, the, the Democratic Party feeling they need to court us in order to win all of those kinds of things. But I mean, at a certain point, it's like banging your head against the wall. And when you see, like, this is what I think what I'm getting at. When did the Democratic Party wouldn't even not listen to the left, but simply swap out its own guaranteed loser for another guy who I don't like, who is in yeah. no way the left, who is yeah. like identical to Joe Biden, except for being younger and more able to have the stamina to get through debates and actually like remember the things he's supposed to say as rejoinder to Trump. Then like, and then they still won't do that. Then at this point, it's not about politics. It's not about um, corporate capture. It's not about all these like tan like obstacles that I'm aware of that I, we're, we're, we're aware that we have to get through. It's about it's just that I'm taking crazy pills and I we got to find another a, another another way around. I, I did want to ask you, I know that we've gone long, but I, by the way, I know we've gone long, too. I don't know about you. I've loved it. I've loved it. I, I yeah, this is my favorite I, kind of episode. Exactly. I really do appreciate you. Know, you. <laughs> I really value this because I, I realize we've gone long. I understand that. Um, I realize that in the best of all worlds, and, and this is a great discussion here about best of all worlds and things like that, we should figure out how to distill it into like 20 minutes. I understand that, right? I understand all that. But what I am telling you is that if we could distill it into that 20 minutes, it would be the exact debate that ought to be going on within the circles, I, I would argue, and exact discussion, because we ought to be going deeper on this and asking the tougher questions and, and wrestling with it and bringing history to it and bringing contemporary concerns to it, blah, blah, blah. So that's, I apologize. That, that's, that's, I really do. I mean, when, you, when you say, like, I don't want to go too far in the history, that's, I love talking to you precisely because that's what really adds to the conversation for me and helps provide some precedent and some support for what the future might look like. And I just think it's so incredibly useful. But to, I mean, to that end, I am curious about two things that came up. I'm going to say them both 
um, even though they're not related, just so I can keep track of of them. <laughs> one was that one was that you mentioned um, fighting uh, leftist fighting at an earlier convention and coming very close to mm-hmm. getting mm-hmm. an agenda adopted. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious what almost close looks like if it's a kind of um, like fictive success, you know, like, a, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, like one mm-hmm. of the, like, like Bernie almost winning twice, you know, the, the kind of like, was it really, really was, was there really any opportunity there or was it? Yeah. I mean, no, it's much closer than that. Um, although Sanders and remember Sanders in 16 did come, you know, it, Sanders closed very fast and closed very strong. It, but, right. You know, but I don't know, John. And the, the, the second question is about Sanders having written this book with him and, mm-hmm. you know, having more exposure to them. I mean, I haven't, spoken to him since the campaign ended, since before the campaign ended. So I am curious whether you have any insight into the choices that are being made by the sensible leaders of the progressive movement, whether it's Sanders or some of the squad members and the like, Mm -hmm. about how they're seeing this moment and the choice to years before the election. We're talking two years before the election date endorsing Joe Biden. Okay. Um, two very good points and and good places to kind of bring us, you know, full circle, uh, noting that we never even discussed the the article at which was going to be the beginning of this conversation. <laughs> and so we have to come back and do that at some point in the future. And and um, but uh, uh, first, is it fictive? Right. Is is this notion that they came close a lie? No, it's not. They came really close. And the party machine, the establishment, had to go into full gear to prevent the future, right? Um, in 1944, at that Democratic convention in, in Chicago, um, Henry Wallace was the sitting vice president of the United States. They wouldn't let him address the convention. They would not let the sitting vice president address the convention because they were terrified of what would happen, right? Mm-hmm. That, that he would, in fact, electrify the convention. So they came up with this absurd construct where they let him give a seconding speech for Roosevelt, right? I mean, think of the insult to the, to the mm-hmm. vice president, right? You're not even gonna let him give a, a regular address. He can come in and do a seconding address, right? He wrote it basically on the back of an envelope and he got up there and he said, you know, okay, basically we've got a choice. We're either gonna be a party, we're about to win World War II. And remember, this is in summer of 44, it's still a lot up for play. He says, we're about to win it. We've got a question, what are we gonna do next? How are we gonna come out of this thing? And I say, we ought to be a party full on for civil rights. We ought to be a party full on for ending the poll tax. We ought to be a party full on for a progressive vision that goes forward pro-union, you know, pro-democracy. You know, I mean, he gave a very bold speech and people went crazy, right? It was electric. Um, There was an effort, Claude Pepper, who was a young uh, senator from Florida at the time. and, And remember, Wallace had support in Southern states from people who actually wanted civil rights. Right. Or wanted to move in the in the proper direction. It was a, an amazingly different politics, uglier politics in many ways, but different. Claude Pepper coming out of Florida sought to get to the, the podium at the 44 convention. He was fighting his way, literally physically fighting his way to get up the steps to the podium. And the the convention was going crazy. The chair of the convention was you know at the podium, not knowing what to do. And Pepper was getting up those steps. He had railroad trainmen, you know, some union folks who were helping him literally physically fight to get to the microphone. If he had mm-hmm. gotten to the microphone, as Pepper has said, he would have said after Wallace's speech, I call for uh, I call the vote for vice president. You know, let's vote for Henry Wallace and have this done. Right. You know, it whether it would have happened, whether it could have worked, we don't know. But that was what he was trying to do. As he got within relative distance of it, um, the one of the key players, uh, the boss from Pennsylvania, shouted to the chairman, shut it down. And the yeah. chairman said, I entertain a motion to adjourn the convention. And they gaveled it, even though the crowd booed, they gaveled it out of out of action. If they had had the vote that night, Henry Wallace would have been renominated. History would have been different. Um, they then... The ne- they came back the next day. They changed the ticketing for the convention. They literally, I mean, you can't even imagine the amount of deals that were done and everything. So they came that close. They came like maybe a few feet on a podium. But, but John, so do you see how, though, 
that sounds so much like all of the rigmarole around the 2016 convention yeah. antics and the rigging of it all. And so, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying about how close it is, but this is what I'm saying about it being kind of a fictive almost. Mm-hmm. If if ultimately the, dem- the, the machine is well-oiled enough to know that even if you make it through the gauntlet, even if you get to the end of the maze, that there's a trap door that opens right before you press you know, you, you clutch yeah. the ring of victory. Yeah, yeah. Then you can, they can give the appearance of you fighting the good fight and getting really far. I think enough of us really thought that Bernie almost made it in 2016 to be fully invested and willing to give our lives to a repeat effort in 2020. Mm-hmm. And look, maybe there is a way that you can avoid the trap door. Maybe it only happens once in a generation. Maybe it only happens once in 200 years. You know, I'm not saying that impossible things don't happen. But it also does, again, start to seem sort of like definitionally insane to keep trying the same thing over and over again when you know that it is rigged. And it does feel like almost a strategy to get us to waste all of our energy. And this is what so many people were frustrated by with, you know, say, Marianne Williamson's choice to run in the Democratic Party. It seemed obvious to folks, and I think it is increasingly obvious to folks as time goes on, that there's just no doing it if you're nothing that requires you to rely on Democrats is ever going to get done. So here's the deal. I'm not saying waste your energy, right? I'm saying that people want to people go the route they want to go. One of the most crazy things in politics is tell people, oh, don't do that, right? People are people make their choice long before the question before these basic. I'm going to go the route I'm going to go. I'm going to I'm going to try a third party route. I'm going to work within the Democratic Party. I'm going to give up, not give up on, on trying to change the world, but I'm going to give up on electoral politics. I'm going to try movement politics in a, in a different form. The great uh, British parliamentarian, Tony Benn, who left parliament in, in, uh, after serving longer than any Labour Party member, was asked, why was he leaving parliament at this critical stage in his history? It was after Tony Blair had won. And he says, you know, I'm tired of being a parliamentarian. I want to get involved in politics. Right. Hmm. And And what he meant was he was going to go out and be an anti-war campaigner and a a, a economic justice campaigner. And he did. He spent the rest of his life doing that in, in incredibly bold ways. Uh, and I think very meaningful ways. And so you, you, you make your choice. I mean, it's silly to tell people what to do. What I am saying is for the people that want to, that are going to fight this fight within the Democratic Party, they're going to do it whether whatever you say and whatever I say. They're going to do it. Well, I guess I kind of am, John. I guess I kind of am trying to tell people what to do. I mean, you like, I'm not it. putting a gun in anybody's head. Yeah. But I, I I, think it's I think it's my responsibility to convey, like, to to make it clear. It's not that I'm, I, you know, we disagree on something. If, if I have, I feel like, some objective evidence, whether it's the historical precedent or anything else, that suggests to me, you know, the behavior of the Democratic Party right now with respect to Biden and swapping him out, even for someone they love. Like, if I have some evidence that suggests that your time and energy will be spent better elsewhere, I think it's my obligation to make that clear to you. So at very least, you're making an informed decision about what you are taking on. What I will say to you is, and I respect that. I respect that, of course. But what I'm saying is that that there are going to be a lot of people who decide to fight within the Democratic Party. There are. You can agree with that or disagree with that. What I am saying is that if they're going to fight within the Democratic Party, they have to fight smarter and stronger and better, right? You can't just become a, an ancillary of the Democratic Party. You can't just go in and say, okay, well, we're going to back you and, and we're asking nothing in return. And So what does that mean about Bernie then? What does that mean about the members of the squad and, and their choice to endorse Joe Biden? They have clearly endorsed Joe Biden, right? Um, yes, they, early. many of them have, <laughs> yes, and many of them have made demands and continue to make demands. But what's the demand following an endorsement mean? Getting back to the Sean Fain example. Yeah, I, I you know, that's a, that's a very good question yet. And yet you continue to do it, right? You fight the fight. And, and here's the deal. Well, I would, I would not continue to do it. I would simply not endorse <laughs> until after my demand were, were met. Of course, but we're not there. That's not where we're at. Right. But right. I guess my question yeah. is why? I mean, do you have any insight? You I mean, you just have. Oh, written I'm not going to speak. I, you know, I, I don't have much insight as regards where, you know, and I wouldn't, you know, I, I can't tell you where, you know, the workings of a, of a particular member of Congress's head is at, you know, something like that. 
it's not something that comes out in the course of the book. Is there any reflection that you've, you know, co-written about, about what happened in 2020 and but there is a reflection. 2016. It is that that I, I think Senator Sanders and and many other folks actually believe Donald Trump is an existential threat, and I think they believe it is such a threat that that um, they accept the idea of a unity, you know, campaign to try and stop this threat, right? And that 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 is, and I think if you if you look at what AOC has said. Um, what many of these members have said, many members of the squad, and people, including people who have been very, very critical of Joe Biden, have said they think Trump is such a threat, such a fundamental threat, that they are going to back Biden, right? My only argument in that regard is that, that if you're backing Biden, you don't do him any favors by simply running around saying he's the greatest, right? There is a different and better message there, and that is that Biden is flawed that his first term was not sufficient, that, that there is so much more that needs to be done and to pressure him and the Democratic Party to do that. Now, I understand the, the argument that the only way you can bring that pressure is by withholding, right? And that may be true. We'll see. But if you're already at that point of endorsement, then the question becomes, well, how do you pressure or how do you influence to do and be better, right? To get to to, to get to a point that where the candidate, in this case, Biden, uh, runs in a way that is has some potential to reach beyond the narrow limits of, of where that candidate is now. Um, and it, will it work? We shall see. Um, but uh, is, is that... I'm skeptic, is, and, I, and I am and I know looking you're skeptic. to Rashida Tlaib, for, yeah. uh, who has charted a different course than the others... In and gave cohort. a remarkable speech just the other day in this regard. I was going to ask if you had heard that. I mean, she takes mm -hmm. a really pointed criticism uh, yeah. of, of Joe Biden um, mm -hmm. in a way that I hadn't heard even from, I think, her before, even though she has very much obviously been very vocal and, mm -hmm. and very uh, morally clear about where she stands yeah. with respect to, to Biden in Gaza. Each year, our country, and I say our country because it is our country, sends billions of dollars to maintain an apartheid government and support the ongoing ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. It is disgraceful that the Biden administration and my colleagues in Congress continue to smear them for protesting to save lives, no matter faith or ethnicity. It is cowardly. But we're not going to forget in November, are we? The International Court of Justice just ruled that the Israeli government must stop its invasion of Rafah. But President Biden says what's happening in Gaza is not a genocide. Where's your red line, President Biden? You all, every single bullet, every single gun, every single weapon, bombs that we send is a sacrifice of our own schools here at home. Many of which, when I go into the schools, have garbage bags over their drinking fountains because they don't have clean water. President Biden, I hope you hear us loud and clear. Attacking the authority of the International Criminal Court and interfering in the legal process is nothing more, nothing more than an attempt to prevent the genocidal maniac Netanyahu and his senior Israeli officials from being held accountable for those crimes against humanity. You are an enabler, President Biden. But wait, wait, you know when my colleagues are outraged? They're outraged over the protest on college campuses in our country. They're more outraged than that, than the atrocities happening right now on the ground in Palestine, the war crimes. Y'all, there's no universities in Gaza. We all know this, we say it over and over again. And now, and now if they get their way, they're going to silence the university here at home. I've interviewed her and and talked to her about some of this. And again, I, you know, it's such a it's such an interesting situation to say, uh, you know, what do you think this person's going to do? I I think we ask this person what they're going to do, right? You know, you, at some point, you know, we'll see. Um, Rashida Tlaib becomes a very very important person in this regard, right? Because of her strong stance that she has taken as regards Gaza, where she ultimately, you know brings herself to or where she ends up is going to be very, very significant. Her speech was very significant the other day. 
Um, and, and I will tell you something. In 2020, I wrote about this quite a bit, um, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Gwen Moore in Milwaukee, uh, several figures in Philadelphia, played an absolutely critical role. These are as, as Democrats who are going to win their congressional seat, right? They're going to win their district, right? They turned, uh, Mark Pocan in, in Madison, Wisconsin, they turned their campaigns into a, uh, a dual campaign for themselves and for the ticket, right? They, they mobilized turnout. And it was mobilization of turnout from below. That was very, very critical to Biden winning. Um, it, it unquestionably, I think, was critical to Biden winning Wisconsin. I think that it also played a real role in a, a much stronger than expected finish in Michigan and a strong finish in Minnesota, and I think ultimately in Pennsylvania. And so what Biden needs to recognize is he doesn't just need these people's endorsement. He needs to actually turn their machines on to do right. what they are capable of doing. And, and, um, and so this isn't about, this isn't about an endorsement. Endorsements are just, those are just words, right? It's about what you actually do to try and, you know, achieve a result. And, and that is still, I think, up for grabs. That's something we still we have, have to- a, I you have 100,000 uncommitted voters in Michigan. Michigan, weirdly, despite that, is the one state, uh, swing state, where among likely voters, Biden yes. is actually up, right? Michigan, Wisconsin, it depends on which poll you look at. Wisconsin it's, it's one bad. One's likely and one's unlikely, and one's Michigan and one's um, Wisconsin. But I think it's with likely voters, he's up in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. And, but barely, and Wisconsin, but, by the way, had, had a, a very large uncommitted vote. Um, but incredibly, the uncommitted vote around the country is in, in some unexpected places. It's been really substantial, right? I mean, and and what I would tell you is, again, uh, I think Tuesday in New Jersey is probably going to be very, very large um, so, for a variety of reasons. So then, so with that being the case, you're looking at your you wife. No, he's still no, no, no. I just got to text us all. But I oh. that being the case, what do you what do you do with that? I mean, uh, I, again, I mean, it's very, this very is... simple. It's it's that it's that you say to Joe Biden, you know. But it's it's you been can, said, John. Oh, I know it's been said, but, he, he he lost Michigan by what, like twenty thousand votes. Uh, here's a hundred thousand people who say, "Oh yeah, we're motivated to come out and vote in a Democratic primary." Biden, but won we will Michigan. not vote for you. Yeah, Biden won. Oh, sorry, sorry. Was, yeah, Wisconsin yeah, is where he yeah, lost by like twenty thousand votes. Wisconsin's the one. Um, in the in the uncommitted vote in Wisconsin was like in the teens thousand. Oh no, no, it's much more than that. Yeah, yeah, no, it was. Uh, I'd have to look back, uh, you know, and I apologize for my ignorance on this, but I think it was. No, I'll tell you right 50, now, forty-seven thousand eight hundred. Yeah, it's around fifty thousand. Yeah, and what <laughs> that's was right. It was about twice as many as they, that he lost yeah. by. And what was significant about Wisconsin is that in the area around the campus in Madison, uncommitted was getting around thirty percent of the vote. Right. It was. Right. It was really disproportionately high. And, and that's in the that, Democratic primary, a primary. Right. So this is this is what I keep coming back to. Like at a certain point, John, I feel like we have to stop saying, well, maybe Biden will figure it out. Maybe Biden will be persuaded. That that primary happens, Wisconsin primary happened on April 3rd. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. We're, we're recording this at the very end of May. So the time for him to, and, and we know that he doesn't give a shit because we've seen how many reports from Axios and the like, and we, we're seeing the people around him in complete and total denial, doing the copium exercise, and he mm -hmm. doesn't care. So that's not a, a dig on uncommitted in the least. I think it's so important for the public to realize, right, that to the extent that the Democrats are losing, it's because they're choosing to. That's right. And so you because don't give, there's, but you don't give up on trying to get them. You know, look, do you bang against the wall um, until they get it? Uh, some people will say no. Some people will say okay. I'm not going to do it. I banged against the wall. Well, this enough, is this right? is the thing that we're not saying, though. It's not it's not apathy. It's to say, well, should you vote for a third party candidate? Should you start trying to build up political alternatives that have are that are going to be guaranteed to have ballot access and not have to go through the chicanery that's happening in New York State right now with Jill Stein or, you know, the the legal onslaught that someone like Matthew Ho had to face in North Carolina? You know, and actually put your money where your mouth is and start building something new in the alternative, because obviously Joe Biden isn't listening. And maybe you can see that's a little premature. Maybe you want to wait a few months to really kind of nail that down. But it does really feel like we're heading in that direction.
Mm-hmm. When you have 100,000 people in Michigan and almost 50,000 people in Wisconsin saying that we could, we will vote for you. We, we're we willing to vote for you. If you, I'm not even saying do, you know, do one state solution. I'm not even saying, you if know, you some amnesty, but just literally cease fire. Yep. Just please stop ha- having me to have to turn on Twitter and see a father holding up a headless baby. That's the line. That's the red line that Biden is unwilling to acquiesce to. You know, at what point, at what point are we kind of, facilitating a mass delusion by pretending that a man who sees these results and has known what's going on for months and is choosing not to believe it can be persuaded if we just choose our own strategy, uh, change our own strategy. And I'm genuinely curious because I'm I'm feeling very distant about what my role is in all of this. And I'm feeling a little stuck, but not, not actually stuck because I'm very much feeling unstuck when I think about third party politics, but very stuck when I think about the persuasion game. Yeah. And I think, I think that, that, you know, I, I'm still actually writes about this, right? And and I don't, as a result, I'm very interested, genuinely interested in where people come down, right? And where they where they they end up on it. And I'll continue to write about it, right? Um, because I I think that that is that goes to the heart of this fundamental question, right? Of you know how do we how do we break out of a politics that has failed? Um, and and we shall see. Honestly, in the next in the next few months, where people where where people make that choice, and it's going to re- be revealed in the polling. Polls are not polls are not false, right? They they are pictures in time. Some polls are bad, but overall, you're going to see that pattern of polling. You're going to see where people end up and and where they they come down on it. And and the the bottom line again, I go back to this core point is where they do come down on it is just the beginning not the end of the process, right? If they choose to go a third party route, then they ought to give that third party more energy and more focus and more effort, right? You know, than they ever have, right? It shouldn't just be a protest vote, right? It should be something to build something, right? No, if that's the absolutely. route they're going to go. And I know you know that. Um, <laughs> and, and weirdly, Donald Trump just a, a day or so ago went to the libertarians and tried to tell them to right. give up on it, right? And the libertarians had a very, very good response to him. They booed him off the stage. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is why I'm committing to you tonight that I will put a libertarian in my cabinet and also libertarians in senior posts. Pretty good. That's pretty big. Or you can keep going the way you have for the last long decades and get you three percent then meet again get another three percent that's that's you know so if you go on a third party route believe in it make it into something if you're going the democratic route right don't simply say well i'm going to vote for biden and say well then i'm done right that's the end of the process no whichever route you go you fight you know within that that route you try to to get the most and the best of it and yes will there be huge barriers Will there always be excuses for, you know, kind of giving up on it or whatever? Yes, there always have been. There always will be. The question is that that the route that you take, right, the choice that you make, um, how do you get the most out of it? How do you how do you move us in the most progressive direction? How do we move toward the left wing of the possible, be it in the short term or the long term? Right. And and, you know, I think it's it's healthy to have that discussion, right, to to wrestle with that question. And and I think sometimes we're not honest with ourselves about it. I think quite often we we think, you know, that it's just a, you know, you choose one route, you choose another. No, it it really is what you do with the route you've chosen. And um I have great respect for people who choose a third party route. I have great respect for people who choose the Democratic Party route. What I don't have respect for is people who just say, yeah, I'm going this way. I'm going that way. But, you know, then I'm going to go do something else. No, this is a critical moment in American history. I do think Donald Trump is a huge threat. I think he is a very, very bad player. And I think that that too many people who are at the high levels in our politics say that, but don't really wrestle with the question of how to deal with that. Right. I mean, chiefly Joe Biden. Right. Yes. I mean, that's part of what yeah. this dissonance is, is to say that this is an existential threat 
and the nation and democracy is on the line, but also I'm going to ignore every poll showing them all but guaranteed to fail to defeat him. Right. And, and also, I mean, keep, to keep on this point, I'm not going to do the moral and politically practical thing of changing policy as regards Gaza. Yeah. Right. I mean, here you have this incredible intersection, morality and practical politics. Right. And and I know people, there are people very cynical about politics and, and often correctly. So they will say, well, I, you know, I just, I, you know, I, I can't. You know, there's my morality and there's my politics. No, they can actually intersect. And and for Biden not to recognize that and to, to fail to recognize that is jaw dropping, because what it means is that he will tell us that we face an existential threat. And yet he will not adjust to address that existential threat. And I fully understand the anger and frustration with it doesn't make the threat go away. Right. The threat is still there. Right. It's just a question of whether there is a strategy or a policy or an approach that can defeat that threat. And um, and so, look, we you and I have spoken for a long time here. And we have wrestled with this fundamental question. Right. And it is fair to say that wise people will have listened to us and come to different conclusions. And that's healthy. That's fine. I don't beat people up for coming to a place where I'm not at. And, and I understand, you know, that, that they won't agree with where I'm at. You know, it doesn't, all, the bottom line is that, that we have such narrow and dysfunctional conversations about politics in America. We should have deeper and more demanding discussions and they should lead us in, they may lead us in multiple directions. We may go different ways, but at the end of the day, it ought to get us toward this attempt, this, this struggle to get us toward, you know, a route that gets us to a more humane and decent world with economic and social and racial justice, save the planet and perhaps peace. Um, I think that if we have this discussion again in October, we will know more. Um, and me, yeah, my fear, John, is that we have known enough for months. I know. <laughs> That's my fear. So I am. You're like, I'm not going to beat people up, and I'm thinking, well, maybe that was my stance before. But I'm like a teamster wrapping a bit of chain link around. The <laughs> well, like, we're gonna we're about to beat some people up if we don't get an eight hour minimum wait, you know, eight hour work day, eight eight eight. We're still waiting <laughs> to see how the teamsters endorse, by the way. Um, you know, and so uh, um, look, and and when I say I'm not going to beat people up, what I mean is, I think I think you know what I mean. It is you're not going to find me saying that people who choose a third party route are somehow wrong, right? Because it doesn't matter if I say that, right? No, I, I, understand, I understand what you're saying, John, but I also yeah. think there's a, there's a fine line between that and like, which side are you on moments? And like, I, I personally, I'll just speak for myself. I feel like I've been doing this now, like having the, a version of this argument since 2020. Yeah, of course. And I started out making it timidly, cautiously saying I wasn't going to beat people up, saying I'm open to hearing different <laughs> perspectives. Let me have the labor organizers on to tell me their theory of how the change is going to work. Let me have, you know, former head of NNU on to tell me how he thinks we're going to get uh, Medicare for all now that Bernie has endorsed uh, Biden. And we're talking about the fall of, you know, mm -hmm. 2020. Let me let me hear what, you know, someone like Heather McGee has to say. Let me see what um, someone who gives really good Democratic Party messaging advice like a uh, a uh, uh, Oh, sorry, uh, Osario. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm blocking her name right now. But, you know, like, let me let me have them all on and we'll talk about it and I'll, I'll hear them out. But I got to tell you that this, for me personally, subjectively, it feels like game time. And I am feeling, you know, like the Finn sitters have a special special place in hell. Like, it's, 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 it's game time. And, you know, it's not about, like, judging people. Like in my personal life, yeah, sure. If you vote, if you if you think it's a threat to democracy and you got to vote for Biden, whatever, you can feel that way. 
But I'm I'm going to tell you <laughs> that Biden is likely to lose precisely because he's not being pushed or, you know, because regardless of being pushed, he will not change. And I want you to be really clear eyed about what the ultimate consequences are going to be of not trying, even at the same time as you vote for Joe Biden, trying to get something else working on the ground that is going to prevent us from being in the same situation four years from now and four years after that and four years after that, just <laughs> like it's been through all of the histories that you just explained yeah. to us going back to 1930 Bloomin' Six. Yep. Oh, I know. And, and, you know, look, Henry Wallace got pushed aside in 44 and then ran as a, a third party candidate in 48. And it ended disastrously. And he came back in. Um, and and, you know, some people will will say, well, that's an argument against third parties. What I say is, look, in every scenario, people try. You're going to try what you think is going to work best. Right. You're going to look for that that route that's going to work. And um, and. My sense is that that where we are at today, going into this summer, right, this very complex summer, and politics always takes shape. The politics of the fall takes shape in the summer. We imagine that it takes place in the, the winter and spring before when it's inside. No, it actually, it, it's in that summer when the conventions are held, when the things happen inside and outside the hall, when the pressure is either there or it is not. And, and... Uh, I think that that a lot of the history of the 2024 campaign is very much unwritten at this point. And uh, we are going to see a, an immense amount of effort to pressure uh, the Democratic Party from within and from outside. Um, and we will, you know, we'll always see where that ends up. Right. I mean, that's you know that. Um, and we again, see. we could come back and 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 look at this. But at this point, again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to one historical example and say that, um, that when there isn't pressure, it goes awry. And there was, in 2004, when John Kerry was the Democratic nominee for president of the United States, there was insufficient pressure from the left. In the primaries, mm -hmm. you did have, you know, a, you know, a primary complex primary battle with Dean and Kucinich and Edwards, other people running, right? But once Kerry was the nominee, there was a great coalescence, right? And everybody's like, well, we just got to beat Bush. I understand that, completely understand, because, uh, you know, Bush and Cheney should have been impeached for what they did as regards to lies about Iraq, et cetera. People were saying, okay, this is our chance. And, and yet Kerry ran an insufficient campaign, right? It was insufficient. And, and, you know, Ultimately, it was relatively narrow loss in, in many senses, but it didn't matter. It was a loss. And there you go. Bush came back, more tax cuts, more you know, crisis for the, for the Republic in so many ways. And so what I'm saying is the pressure matters. Where that pressure comes, from inside or outside, that you can have a great debate about and a healthy debate. But it's got to come. It's got to continue. And, and when it doesn't come, you know, when everybody gets on board and says, OK, yeah, we're we're, just, we're all heading down the track. That doesn't it, it never ends well. It never ends well. And so, um, you know, what I would argue is that what we see this summer as regards pressure on the Democratic Party. From within, from without, where that pressure comes is the pressure is healthy for the party. It's a good thing. And where it ends. Democrats get to choose that, right? They, you know, I, again, I go back to being a structuralist. I think that it's very, very hard to get this ship to, to move course. Um, but it is not acceptable to not try, no matter which, no matter what route you try to, to get it to do so. Because I think that we are agreed at this point that the, the Democratic Party is not on a course that is healthy that is potentially leading toward, you know, A, beating Trump, which I think is really, really important, but B, achieving the sort of victory that could actually do what needs to be done in this country. And, and not, not your fault, but mine. We have not talked that much about what needs to be done, right? You know, we've talked a lot about practical politics, but what needs to be done, I mean, we have a housing crisis. We have a health care well, crisis. Well, this is not on the table. 
Right. I mean, it's not on the table. Exactly. I mean, it is when you vote for Jill Stein, I would I would put out there mm-hmm. or Cornel West or Claudia De La Cruz or whoever. Mm-hmm. I think the le- left needs to coalesce behind somebody. And that should be the person with most ballot access, in my humble opinion, um, since I think those are all great people substantively. But yeah, it's not it's not on the table. And I would argue that's the fault of the D- Democratic Party. And that's the fault of Biden. And that's why everything is so toxic and bad. Um, and so that's why my job is not like, I don't feel like my job is to be a booster for Joe Biden. It's to be a booster for the left and the people who represent left interest, especially when the, um, the role that some people play of, I'm going to, I'm willing to vote for you, but you have to move my direction is not going well. Because I think, again, there's a cynical part of me that thinks, um, even under the best organized, best case scenario, Biden's not moving. He's not moving for neoliberals and he's certainly not moving for the left because it's just it's beyond reason. We're in a Mm -hmm. we're in a post rationalization, like post rational political space. And that's part of why we see what's so chaotic on the right. It's not just the Trumpers that are like post reason. It's also Mm -hmm. liberals. Um, and I think I think that, that the conversation we've had today really exemplifies that. I think we have to leave it there. John uh-huh. Nichols, I really appreciate you spending two hours with me today. Tell the people where they can find more of you and your work if they still haven't gotten enough. Oh, my gosh. After two hours, they should have more than enough. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but uh, always at the nation dot com. That's where I write. In fact, I, I my in the next day or so, I'll have a big piece up on Trump's visit to the Libertarian Convention, which is absolutely one of the most interesting moments in contemporary politics. I also have a piece coming up on um, a Republican, Thomas Massey, who I think is yeah. very flawed in many, many ways, who beat APAC um, yeah. in his primary. That's a fascinating story. And this is... Yeah, I'm looking... Uh, yeah, go ahead. I try to write about these things, right? That I think politics is much broader than just, you know, like the presidential race. There, there's so much going on in politics. So some of that is there. Um, I've written a lot of books and uh, and I uh, apropos of this conversation, the book that that I would think matters is The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, which really is a a look at at many of the things, much of the history that we've kind of worked through here. Um, So I'll leave it at that, except to say that, you know, you know, my regard for you um, and uh, and the the pleasure it is to uh, come and, and talk to you. The feeling really is mutual, John. I've really enjoyed this. I really appreciate how generous you've been with your time, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with the audience. Thank you for listening um, and tuning in and supporting this podcast. You know, you can get an extra episode of Bad Faith every Monday at patreon.com slash patreon.com slash Bad Faith Podcast. Thank you for supporting this podcast. And as always, take care of yourselves and keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.